Today's video was brought to you with the help of my Patreon supporters. By supporting certain tiers, you too will be thanked for helping me create certain videos. Today's new sponsor is Fel Martins, who apparently thinks of me as his long-lost twin. It, wait. Oh my god, I think one of the clones found me. I may need to talk to my people about this. Also, uh, this video has some flashes of light. Not enough to cause seizures, I think, but I wanted to give a warning before watching this. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Smartest Moron, where I'm in dire need of a haircut. Please help me by wearing a fucking mask for God's sake. And today we're talking about more Square Enix games, because, well, let's face it, a lot of their series can be considered niche, given how neglected they can be. Well, I say neglected, but Valkyrie Profile has endured more than other titles like Parasite Eve. On top of living through the PS2 and DS generation, there was even a mobile game to help expand on the lore. However, I don't really have a high opinion of free-to-play titles and have no plans to cover that particular game whatsoever. Here's basically an over-exaggeration of my thoughts on such games. If you like it, fine, but yeah, I'm not really fond of this kind of game and Fake Go was the closest to me liking it. Maybe that one Final Fantasy game if you want to twist my arm since some character interactions are fun. I just don't have the time, money, or energy for this kind of thing, so if you are hoping I talk about the lore of this stuff, yeah, not happening, especially when the game was canned. Anyway, Valkyrie Profile was originally released on the PS1, but we're gonna take a look at the PSP port, which included Lenneth in the title. You could even get it on iOS and Android, though, once again, I don't really touch mobile stuff. No point when I have a dozen handhelds that can do it better, and a Switch. Especially when this game requires precise combos, and I don't want my thumbs in the way of that. There's not much of a personal story with this one. Like with Kodelka, I ended up trying to find and experience some older games to save on cash, which included emulation. Valkyrie Valkyrie Profile would face difficulties, but that's when I made the shocking discovery there was a PSP version. As a reminder, I wasn't internet savvy back then. Someone I once knew in Singapore bought it for me, and the rest is history. It was an interesting experience since my knowledge of Norse mythology had been limited largely to Marvel's own take with Thor. I choose to run toward my problems and not away from them. That's what Though I have gained a bit more thanks to playing Dad of War. However, entertainment media can only do so much, like leaving out details involving rape often seen in Greek mythology, and making Zeus look like a total hero when he isn't. So yes, that Hercules movie is purely propaganda. Anyway, so long as things are interesting enough, I'm not gonna harp on the issues presented in other games, especially when I don't have the time or motivation to look it up myself. Fate is a slight exception as I feel it misses some potential with certain characters. Anyway, I got off track. Point is, I played Lenneth, liked what I saw, played Samaria, liked what I saw, and then finally played Covenant of the Plume and... Um... Let's just cover Lenneth and get this over with. Now the game actually has the option to view a cutscene following the character Platina and her friend Lucian. This might seem a bit strange, especially when you can't really view any other scenes like this, but there's a reason for that. The beginning of the game takes nearly an hour to complete, and then it allows you to truly dive into the mechanics. So cutting off about 10 minutes or so was a wise move for people who just want to combo monsters into oblivion. And of course we can't just press the start button to skip things because this was a PS1 game. Anyway, Platina is doing chores for her family and accidentally bums into the men in black. Seriously, did anyone else think of them when they saw these guys? She is scolded by her mom rather harshly and even slapped for her troubles. Her friend Lucian sneaks her out in the middle of the night and tells them they have to flee for Platina's parents sold her off to some slavers, which is what happened to his own sister. While they escape the town, their journey is anything but easy. Apparently a lot of time passes, though I wouldn't have known without someone telling me due to how the scenes transition, a common problem seen later in the game. During this time, Platina starts to lose hope, and eventually both she and Lucian end up in a field of flowers of the poisonous variety. Once he realizes this, he tries to get her back, but it's way too late. She has no will left to live after realizing her parents never loved her combined with the long, fruitless journey. Platina later dies in his arms, and the event would further scar Lucian for the rest of his life. Also, this scene demonstrates how, um, kinda bad the voice acting can be. I'm so glad to have known you, Lucian. But I have too many awful memories. I just want to forget, forget it all. Now granted, it's not the worst I have ever heard. I share an example from Chaos Wars after all. It's just 
kinda awkward to listen to. Also, you may notice some of the voices sound familiar if you grew up with Pokemon in the 90s, or anime in general. And I do mean that. Latina and later Lanth of Valkyrie is voiced by Megan Hollingshed, aka the same voice actor who did Nurse Joy for six seasons. Lucian is voiced by Eric Stewart, who voiced both Brock and James for six seasons too, as well as a few other certain Pokemon. Then there's this Archer, whose name I don't want to pronounce, who is voiced by Tara Sands, who voiced Mokuba, and I constantly kept thinking of this thanks to Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged. What could I possibly say? There are no words. Shut up, Mokuba. There are definitely a few other examples that definitely felt odd to hear. Some of the voices are serviceable, at least, and do improve on the first scene I showed off. For instance, the voice of Lazard, Madeline Blaustein, doesn't quite do so well with spell enchantments, sounding way too much like Meowth for this creepy, powerful wizard, but anywhere else she actually does the role well enough. Hell, I didn't even notice the role was played by a woman. For those choosing to skip this scene, we truly begin with the awakening of Lenneth, who is greeted by her fellow gods along with her superior, Odin. She is made aware of a war about to rage on in Valhalla against the Vanir, and is thus tasked with going down to Midgard to recruit humans for a war called Ragnarok, and the chosen humans are referred to as Ein Harriar. Basically, think of her as kind of a grim reaper, sent to clean the souls of the dead, but in her case, she chooses those who are deemed worthy of serving the gods. So, spoilers, like 90% of the people you meet with unique character models they're gonna die. Speaking of which, some characters kind of have inconsistent visuals. For example, Mistina is supposed to have lighter hair, but the model has brown. Or Lazard here, whose in-game model makes him out to look more goth than intended, and the mental image does kind of make me laugh my ass off. The first among the Ein Harriar we meet are a mercenary named Arngrim and a princess named Jolanda. After defeating a vicious creature alongside his comrades, he is praised for his hard work, though the king decides to be a smug dumbass and pisses off Arngrim under his breath while giving him his reward. So the son of guts decides to ruin the ceremony by smashing the head of the statue to humiliate the king and making him think the rich douche was going to get a punch in the face. Fortunately for those deprived of seeing the rich in pain, or just want to see Odin hurt at least, be sure to watch The Ballad of Mike Hagar. No, I'm dead serious. They actually use Odin, and it's freaking awesome. Don't worry. I'll wait. I'll sit here and wait. Welcome back. Wasn't that awesome? He's also living with his brother, who has a hurt leg and tries to draw as a hobby, though Arngrim finds it useless if it can't be sold. Apart from their discussion about their respective lifestyles, Jelanda is plotting her revenge for Arngrim for humiliating her father, and so goes undercover to try and hire him for a special job. And it's a comedic bit I'm not really going to describe as I want you to see it. Arngrim does eventually discover her identity and decides to say nothing. Understanding her rage and, hey, if she hasn't called the full fury of the guards, what can she really do? Apart from embarrassing him, anyway. Again. Well, he finds out when someone else hires him for a job, and she's being transported out of the city. And he only finds out when a bunch of knights open up the crate. He and his other associate are accused of kidnapping, but things grow worse as Jolanda eventually turns into a monster. Made to drink something called ghoul powder as one person thought it was medicine. Arngrim's in a really tough spot, but Lenneth decides to step in and save him. And as much as he wanted to save Jolanda, there was nothing either of them can do at that point. What he can do is seek revenge against some mage who wants to buddy up to Vilnor who helped to orchestrate this event. Lynn is about to allow Arngrim to die, but Jolanda, now main and Harriar, begs Lynn to save him, which she does so, disposing of the mage, and letting Arngrim clean house as he keeps killing soldiers gunning for him, as they still think he committed a ton of crimes. Well, with the current body count as he casually swings his sword around, I can't exactly blame their reasoning. What's funny is how he and Lenneth are talking during all of this, Arngrim taunting Lenneth with how his strength will be useful to get her attention, all as he casually murders people. There is an important discussion regarding how he views Valkyrie and what she really does, not just simply some goddess who takes the souls of the dead forcefully like those in Nipelheim. Granted, she kinda tries to do that to one certain character later on in a humorous scene. In a way, we kinda get one of the themes of the game spelled out for us, with how characters are able to find a new path through death. It kinda appeals to Arngrim, likely more so than being a criminal or satisfying the will of another greedy king. And with base with a character he actually respects, but never showed up till now, he takes his own life, choosing to live on as an Ein Harriar. And leaving his brother in jail later, never to be seen again. Freya then finally takes you to their first dungeon to test out the gameplay mechanics. It should be noted she seems to recognize Arkham, hinting at yet another mystery for the game in addition to Lenneth looking like a grown-up Latina. The game itself has eight chapters, and in each one, barring the last one, you are required to send up two Ein Harriar or just one. Freya will give you a list of what she wants out of them, which I can't seem to pull up after this. By pressing start, Lenneth can focus, listening to souls who don't have long for this world or finding dungeons to grind in. And if you play the game normally, that's basically it. Grind, fight, send up when ready, repeat. You aren't even required to complete most dungeons, so if, say, one has an annoying puzzle, 
you can just skip it. Or if another is kicking your ass too much. You can even retry as many times as you want, but you are on the clock here. Each action takes up a period, and simply focusing and finding a new dungeon or person eats up the time. You can veer off course and go into a town to learn more of the world, maybe meet some of the future in Harriar, but this rarely leads to anything. Hell, sometimes you won't even get that much useful information. It can be done to maybe get something in a Harriar once held, which is handy at least. But what if you decided to just say, screw it, just rest, stop, eat up the time? Well, Freya takes it understandably well. Anyway, the gameplay in earlier story fights was mostly just hang a face button corresponding with the character. Now with an actual party, the goal of combat is to string together combos. Assuming the overpowered Freya doesn't just one-shot bows. You can knock a foe into the air or down onto the ground, and it fills up the green gauge on the bottom left. Once filled, characters who participated are allowed to perform the Purified Weird Soul, otherwise known as their finishing strike. Oh, Burns. My power has awakened! Finishing strike! Dreaded Dragon! Doing these already yields a ton of damage, but by filling up the gauge once again, it allows for another to be unleashed right then and there. At this point, the goal is to rack up a ton of hits and figure out which attacks are best suited to lead to a final blow worth a huge amount of damage. Mages handle things a bit differently though, for their finishing strike depends on the kind of staff they wield. Normally they just use the spell repeatedly for big damage, but with the right weapon, it can turn into great magic, utterly destroying foes and changes based on the spell type equipped. And based on the numbers you're currently seeing, it sounds like this game can be quite broken, huh? Let me put it this way. Let me test this uh, Spider-Man figure and see if it can actually stand with a broken leg. It could not. Ah, oh, shit, I actually broke it. Yes, there are systems in place to prevent it, like the charge turn or the CT gauge, which can fill up depending on these moves being used, preventing them from being spammed. Thus, you have to hit enemies on the ground to gain these purple gems. The downside is how these things sometimes just don't get absorbed by the character I need them for, and in earlier chapters, there's very little consequence. Magic spells targeting all foes can make short work of mobs with little to no effort, especially with good stabs. And you don't have to worry about CT outside of combat, so I can use this stuff with reckless abandon. Now, to encourage you not nuking everything at every turn, there are limited enemies whenever you enter a dungeon, so you can't grind without re-entering it. And don't forget, you do have a limited time with exploring these dungeons. So the alternative is to master comboing with your characters, juggling enemies in the air to get these crystals. These will boost your experience points by a significant amount, leading to faster level ups. And those spells will rarely give even one crystal. All this stuff I feel works for boss fights, but as the game just threw more and more mobs, I was either spamming great magic, or using this one accessory to slip through another dimension to avoid encounters. The exception being stronger enemies, of course, since I want the EXP, or in certain encounters where I screw up if an enemy is too small. And doing that can be challenging depending on the character you use, meaning some attacks can completely miss their mark. This isn't really a negative unless you paid attention to this footage and notice how often June and Aelia were missing with their attacks despite seemingly being in range of hitting them. You also have to consider the weight of monsters when stringing together combos since flying enemies tend to be easily shot up into the air, some enemies are way too short to be hit, you get the drill. Valkyrie Profile was among the one of the first to do combat similar to say Endless Frontier or Project Cross Zone, but usually the one who does it first tends to do it the worst or it will age poorly. Not to say Valkyrie Profile still can't be fun or anything, it just has some distractions one can't just ignore. Thus, this requires some close observation, since mashing the buttons doesn't always lead to success. And if the enemy is already dead when doing the combo and you want to tag in another character, well, you can't really do that. But in a lot of ways, the game requires you to find ways to break it, since it can be kind of a cheater. For example, there's this dragon boss that's optional on the B ending and mandatory on the A ending. While it can hit hard, it's nothing out of the ordinary until its health goes down a certain amount and it uses great magic literally every turn, and it's powerful enough to kill your team. Apart from trying to get stronger to drain his health after a certain point, what do you do? Well, there are skills that can be purchased with CP after leveling up. Aside from the traits to improve heroic value, which is very important for Freya and sending them up to Valhalla, there are skills to boost stats by a massive amount too, and there are other equipable techniques, like Auto Item, which can help instantly revive party members, or Guts, which can occasionally give characters the chance to survive fatal damage. 
So yeah, combining these two kinda made my team almost unstoppable, leaving everything up to luck. But when enemies and bosses have gimmicks like these later on, I don't have much of a choice. There are a few other examples, like this boss capable of reviving its partner, which later comes back as a regular enemy that's hard to hit, basically requiring great magic to even kill it effectively, since there's always that chance a bow shot could just be blocked. And yes, the bonus post-game dungeon, the Seraphic Gate, kinda requires this since the boss does an obscene amount of damage. Granted, against the hamsters, it might just be delaying the inevitable. And yeah, you heard me right. Square Enix seemed to love the idea of making the cute stuff be the most dangerous creatures ever, like the squirrels from Parasite Eve. Although wait, does, does this mean the Norse gods can be beaten by Hamtaro? Okay, I don't usually ask for fan art on this show, but someone show Leneth being terrified by Hamtaro. Please, I need that. Or Odin, I don't care which character it is. Plus, there's also another dungeon that's kinda bullcrap, the Cave of Oblivion. You can only enter this one time and... Honestly, it's just there so you can find tougher enemies or hidden treasures, and this can sometimes include enemies that can one-shot you too. And really, that's basically a dice roll of what you get. Once the first dungeon is nearing its end, you might have noticed something in the boss fight. Leneth is able to perform a three-hit combo now thanks to a sword granted by Freya, and previously she could only hit about one time. This is because different weapons have certain things to worry about beyond just an attack boost, one of which being my worst foe in all of gaming. Sir... What the fuck? Now before you freak out and flip up Jim Sterling because he gave Breath of the Wild a 7 out of 10, not every weapon breaks, thank god. It only happens to weapons made by humans, which are most commonly found in dungeons or by hitting monsters enough times. They can usually deal more damage, but that's kind of one of the only real benefits unless there's something special about them. There's a reason I love using the Dragon Slayer on dragons after all. Back to the attack patterns, each Iron Harriara has three attacks normally, and by observing the O's and X's, you can see how many attacks can be used and which ones. For instance, this dinosaur spear is incredibly powerful, but you can only use one attack. Fortunately, the move I could use was Alias Thrust Attack, which is her best, as opposed to her other two, which kinda suck. Point is, it's possible to get a great weapon and be limited to a crappy move. It's why I almost always use a weapon with three hits. Also, there's a chance each weapon can break, even if you do nothing with it. I found that out accidentally in one dungeon and laughed my ass off before realizing how screwed I was. As for spellcasters, there's an extra step, as they must know the spell in order to attack. And I hope you choose one an enemy is weak to, since if you don't, you can't change it in the middle of a fight, unlike with other characters. The safest bet, aside from stealing treasures from Odin, is to create your own gear. See, enemies don't drop money, but there is still a currency obtainable, magic points. Simply obey the whims of Freya and Odin, or convert it from certain items, and you can gain some to help forge new weapons and armor for your team. Then there's transmutation, and this. This is probably the leading cause why the game can be kinda broken, beyond just character skills. This involves making items into other items. However, at certain points, you can make accessories called the Creation Gem and Jewel. With these, you can turn broken weapons into something truly fantastic if you are lucky. On top of getting one of the best weapons of the run for that character, or even damn good armor, you could even just convert them into huge amounts of MP for later use. Maybe get that one super expensive item just to get one of the best swords in the game. If you're expecting more info about the plot, well, that's the thing. I don't want to spoil these stories and a lot of them abruptly end, leaving you raising an eyebrow. For example, Lawfer, the guy who fought alongside Arngrim in the very first fight, tries to break his best friend's bro free from prison, and it's implied he's going to die from this. And then... nothing. He's suddenly in my party and I feel like we skipped some steps. I mean, technically there's a bit more story to that, but that ending is still abrupt. That said, there are many plots going on, such as one where a group of friends are trying to find the Dark Knight Grey and get revenge for a friend they lost because of him, or there are the Adventures of Gandar, a powerful mage searching for the Dragon Orb. Maybe you'll get some expanded stuff on Lucy and see what happened to him later, but if you fail to get ending A, the plot is really light. Only one dungeon has significant plot details, the Castle of Dapan depicting another, darker Valkyrie using on Harriar to punish a king for his crimes. Since it's more relevant to Game 2, I won't really be looking at it much. The review is long enough already. And in order to get the canon ending... This is a canon. This is the canon I mean. You kinda need a guide for it. See, there is a seal rating that goes down depending on certain actions, like coming face to face with a vampire on par with Odin himself, Brahms, or maybe finding events linking Lenneth to Platina. However, sending up characters boosts it back up, meaning you could potentially miss this ending. Even years later, I haven't memorized all the vital details. And trying to disobey both gods, well, I 
I already demonstrated what would happen. There are three difficulty modes, and normally I never mention this stuff in detail since it doesn't usually add much. Well, apart from seeing how easily I can die in Raido Kuzunoha for comedic effect. Should you choose easy mode, it's kind of the least fun way as you'll lose access to some characters, have less dungeons, and can't even access the true ending. Normal or hard mode is usually the way to go, and yes, there are more differences besides tougher foes. For instance, normal mode has characters join as set level, while hard mode demotes them all to level 1. Each difficulty also has their own unique dungeons, though hard mode is the only one that offers new characters. Point is, both modes are worth playing to see what the game has to offer. Normal would be my recommendation for beginners, though due to one simple thing, platforming. Oh yes, you aren't just going from place to place beating up monsters, a lot of dungeons have puzzle elements and platforming challenges to make things tougher. If you're going for ending B or C, it's doubtful you'll be doing it this much, but if you want the toughest fights for all the good items, or just to see more content, you'll have to do it. Though some argue easy mode is actually harder since you miss out on a lot of good items. Really, my only complaint about the game, apart from some heads being way too big or non-existent, is the way Lineth jumps. There are some tight ones that basically require you to run and jump, but sometimes the platform required is so small you may not be able to get to it, leading to dozens of annoying retries. It only feels like it sometimes works, and the water is somehow my worst enemy in this game. For even if her toes are wet, Lineth can't jump at all. Guess those wings really are for show. Oh, and the Tower of Fire, or wherever the hell it's called, it forces you to take damage. I mean, look at all this chaos. If there's a trick I'm missing, by all means, tell me, because this was very annoying. And in this dungeon, which, by the way, I freaking love the terrifying design as it feels like I'm inside of a demon, also has platforming that feels a tad slippery and requires quick movement. At the same time, dungeons like these can force you to think outside the box. You may have noticed that Lanth can freeze certain enemies or create crystal platforms to get to new areas. Sometimes you may even need to shoot upward to reflect blasts or burst the crystals. Doing it on the ground can knock you away a decent distance distance, perfect when you need to jump but have a ceiling gang in the way of that, or if you burst a crystal, the particles can form a temporary platform. At first, I thought this was worthless, maybe to help save a jump, but I began to understand the design for some places have treasure chests beyond your reach until you do this. Not the easiest thing in the world, hell gang this one spirit took freaking ages due to the tight platforming, but I do enjoy thinking outside the box like that. All this isn't to say that normal mode lacks any puzzles or anything, it's just hard mode, well, is harder. Now because of hard mode, having a character start at level 1 can seem a nightmarish situation. For example, some equipment can raise HP and CP for every level gained. Well, give those to a level 1 character, and they may start getting a lot more benefits, perhaps even able to send them up to Valhalla sooner, or with far more of a fighting chance. It's easier to raise up a level 1 character than a level 12 character is what I'm trying to say. Or even just to help your own permanent party member stand alongside Lenneth better by gaining more health. One thing I do love is how you gain experience points by completing certain tasks in a dungeon. It helps guide you in the right direction when completing a puzzle, and can be used to level up characters lagging behind. And it's not even necessary unless you want to use certain characters, especially in hard mode, when you don't feel like grinding all the way from level 1, or just lack enough enemies. It's even helpful for those struggling with the main game and need a quick boost. Overall, Valkyrie Profile has aged quite a bit when you compare it to the newer games like Endless Frontier, who use the combat system more effectively. And even with some dungeon designs being quite interesting, some elements can feel unfair, and jumping can be a bit of a pain in the ass. However, I still find the game perfectly playable, has a ton of variety in constructing your team, and has replay value thanks to the difficulties offering new things and not just making more enemies hit really, really hard. Plus, even if you don't care about the main story or can't get the true ending, knowing about the characters and seeing their interactions with the gods above is fun. Though I wish there was way more. Maybe the manga goes a bit deeper into this, but I don't really know. Though I'm tired of tiptoeing around the real meat of the story, so let's ascend down into Midgard and see the true story of Lenneth. I pray that we shall meet again. So now you run? You cannot possibly believe that love can exist between humans and gods. What did you just say? Between human and god? You really don't have any idea what you are, do you? When it comes to spoilers, only Valkyrie really matters since she gets the most character development. I will try to do something at the end, though. Lenneth's growth can arguably be linked to her and Harriar, as the seal slowly begins to break when meeting certain people. Regardless, though, Lenneth does offer a helping hand when she can. Not in keeping characters alive, at least not the soul she is meant to claim, but in kinda granting them a last wish. 
According to one discussion, this is to help make the transfer easier, but she's not devoid of feelings. She's easily disgusted by violent acts committed to others, such as when one thief tried arguing for a right to be an Einherjar to avoid going to Nipelheim, and hearing his list of crimes wasn't helping his case in the slightest. And after Lazar kills his teacher and her husband in an attempt to lure Lenneth to him, of course she finds the act absolutely abhorrent. At the same time, though, the brainwashing keeps showing its effects as she talks about rules, and how gods and humans could never join. Plus, she also seemed to not like being involved in romantic affairs, like helping a certain archer seeing his girlfriend one last time. <sighs> this is not my task. I am no goddess of love. I should also note his heroic value is super low, and his worth as a fighter is abysmal. It's only his kindness that draws Lenneth to him which in turn probably stirred something inside of her as Platina. But the sight of gentleness will constantly be suppressed by what the gods taught her, and at times, one could argue she's doing these acts just so the Einherjar can join and do her bidding. Hell, the player can technically emulate such ideas by leveling up the character, customizing them, and then just sending them up doing exactly as Freya wants. Granted, I mostly do it for the goodies, and so Freya doesn't nuke us via ending C. Apart from Arngrim, many other factors do help her make her question just what the hell she is. One such character is Lazard, an insanely powerful mage who has mastered magic thought to be lost, and possesses the Philosopher's Stone to gain even more knowledge. As stated before, he kills his own former teacher and her husband in order to lure Valkyrie to him, revealing how he has been capturing elves with the intention of making Lenneth human, and by extension, his. Man, Harry Potter really turned into an asshole. Lenneth even briefly freaks out, destroying containers until she realizes how closely they resemble her, making her question what the hell she even is. This isn't help when she meets Brahms, and his words keep confusing her, hinting more at Odin's plans of manipulating her. And finally, there's Lucian. He had been haunted by her death and his life wasn't any picnic, forced to turn to thievery. Not really sure how long this has stayed with him, but even his partner was tired of sharing him with a dead woman and even hit Lenneth with a rock out of jealousy. Eventually, Lucian dies after one of his own party members decides to steal something from a rather rich and powerful person, and they decide to decimate the entire town. Barely anyone makes it, including Lucian, and he's soon made into an Iron Harrier by Lenneth. He is actually reluctant about leaving Claire behind, and no joke, this is how the scene ends. You know, I I would actually comment on this, but um I don't think there's anything I could say. Though I suppose one could argue we don't see any extra stuff because maybe it's meant to reflect how gods view humans which does admittedly create the hilarious image of Lenneth impatiently waiting for people to die, or just flat out dismissing their concerns. Anyway, the real importance to Lucian comes when he has to be sent up to Valhalla, and has some issues Lenneth has yet to resolve. So he ends up opening up to her, taking the Valkyrie to where he once lived and how much she reminds him of Platina. Even with the helmet off, he's constantly reminded of Platina's presence. Everything comes back to the surface as these feelings start forming. Though even he questions how bizarre the situation is, and his feelings aren't helped when Lenneth actually kisses him, memories of Platina likely stirring once more. Even if she acknowledges how this love is impossible, she still wants to see him again. Although, the romance still feels kinda odd to me, because nothing is really established beforehand with Lucia and Lenneth, as in stuff I feel would lead to Lenneth feeling this way. If you never knew about the Platina stuff in the beginning, this wouldn't really hold up so well. Although, that's actually another good reason why that scene is separate from everything else, just so you can keep viewing it again and again. Establishing Lucian earlier might have been helpful, like, say there's a situation where Lucian must be sent up her Odin's orders. Maybe him fearing the seal could be broken, and this helps stir more stuff in Lenneth. Could have easily had Freya intervene too, maybe resealing those memories and Lucian taking notice. Not enough to see through the deception, but still in asking those questions. Now, one would think the final enemy would be Odin or Freya, considering what they did to Lenneth, and how they screwed over Midgar by taking the dragon orb for themselves. Or maybe it'll be Lazard, given how he wants to be a god. Maybe even Brahm, since he has another Valkyrie, Selmeria, sealed in crystal for unknown purposes. You will be wrong, for it's Loki who hasn't really had a strong presence in the plot. He tries to wedge himself into it when Lucian is told by Frey that Lenneth had her memory sealed, so he helps the Iron Harrier go use the Dragon Mirror to communicate with her. It's all just a trap, though, with Lucian getting killed in frame for using the mirror to send the orb elsewhere. It feels like the game wants me to assume stuff about Loki to make it obvious he would be the villain, like the mythology or what Marvel did, but for the purposes of the plot, it doesn't quite work out so well. Hell, near the end of the game, there's actually text boxes dumping information as opposed to telling it naturally. You could have done like maybe a cutscene of each chapter showing each of the gods mingling with one another. I tried to piece it together, like maybe Loki's supposed to be a dark reflection of Lenneth, but it just doesn't work.
You had one job. Just the one. Now, to be fair, in an interview I did read, there was some content taken out. But at the same time, I'm reviewing the PSP version, so why couldn't it just be added in? Hell, you wouldn't even need voice acting. Anyway, despite my ranting, Lucian's bit is good. He believes the earring might help give Leneth a blast push she needs to remember her life as Platina. But Leneth is too angry to even consider the idea, believing the bullcrap that got sped to her too much, and claiming Lucian has committed an unforgivable crime. Eventually, after hearing Lucian was killed once and for all, she decides to go to the field to find the earring that was buried with Platina, and indeed, Lucian was right. All the memories come flooding back, breaking the seal Freya and Odin placed, and it turns out they had a backup plan as Leneth's body is taken over by the third Valkyrie, Hrist. Within the Castle of Japan dungeon, Hrist was only seen there, with Leneth being forced to time travel back to the era as part of a failed trap. Again, I'll provide more details in Game 2, but the point is the scene serves as the only real build-up for Hrist, whose personality basically boils down to obeying Odin no matter what and looking down at Einherjar, being a more violent and evil version of Leneth to boot. And quite frankly, she enjoys her job. Lynn still has her soul around, trying to protect the earring Hrist tries to destroy, and her soul is seemingly kinda shattered in the process. Of all people, Lazard is the one to help the gang out, working together with Messina to use the homunculus she stole to create a temporary body for Leneth. However, they still need the real thing and combat Hrist, who in turn is fighting Brahms. Once again, info more relevant for Game 2, though we do get to see how apparently Argrim in a past life also apparently dealt with Brahms too. Point is, Hrist is soundly beaten by the party and the Lord of the Undead, and with their powers combined, Leneth is restored. So let's see, her body was taken over, her soul was broken and later fixed, and all of her memories just came back to her. It should be no surprise then that she kinda, sorta, well, loses it. Everything hits her at once, from the word she listened to from her Einherjar, all the way to her memories with Lucian and the last words she said to him before he died. All these sudden feelings hit her like a freaking mega flare from Bahamut, feeling intense regret and fleeing the room, and desperately searching for the earring Lucian told her of fine, the last thing she has to remember him by. And it's in vain, leaving her to feel the full force of despair. And while I'm kinda meh on the romance, I feel it's a really well done scene and the acting isn't terrible either. And this is the part where, well, we get those text stumps like I said. Loki is finally playing his hand, wiping out the veneer alongside his demonic pets, and even makes short work of Odin, all by using the dragon orb he stole, which is believed to be responsible for the decline of Midgard, given all the demons and whatnot happening. And I gotta admit, Leneth refusing to do Freya's bidding is satisfying. She ends up yelling about how the emotions will hold Leneth back, that she will lose everything, and well... Yeah, you can see how well thinking like a god did for these people. Even Freya's talk of emotions is kind of bullcrap when, well, she immediately cries over Odin's dead body. Leneth starts to feel responsible for a lot of what happened, or at least feels like she should be the one to set things right since Freya and Odin aren't going to do anything. Well, the former are still crying over the latter, so that's kind of understandable. Even when she faces Loki, she still can't forgive herself, the grief's still choking at her heart. And now, I get to talk about this moment. When the gang fight Loki, he proves to be too strong and suddenly uses the Dragon Orb to wipe out everything. Like, remember the Armageddon spell Orsted can use in Libelive? That's basically what it is. And he does so all while taunting Lynn to just be as selfish as the gods she once served, saving only herself. She is able to do so to withstand the damage, but then... Well, the game kinda sorta does an ass pull as she suddenly becomes a god of creation, able to reverse all the damage done by Loki. So you see, God is technically one of us, so at the end of the last review, I, I wasn't mistaken or anything. <laughs> I'll just shut up now. I say kinda because the power she just unleashes is questionable when she never really demonstrate any ability remotely like this. Even healing magic seem out of her control. However, after thinking it over while editing the review, it is kinda fitting. Remember how death kinda works in the series? If Lenth doesn't save a soul, they just become property of hell or maybe haunt the living world, maybe even becoming a monster. In a way, she is bringing them back to life, just making them reborn in another world. However, as we see with Odin and Lucian, they are not immortal. They can still die, and Lenneth can do nothing to save them. So, becoming a god of creation makes sense, since she was, in a way, restoring life back to those fallen heroes. Having a godly form of that makes sense to me. Or maybe I am the one pulling stuff out of my ass. Not the first time. Um, phrasing? On the other hand, I feel the game knows this, which is why it flashes back to earlier scenes with Lazard and his homunculi, with how he wanted to become a god. See, Odin kinda did the same thing as Lazard, aka using elves for his own purpose. Apparently, the strength of a god is static, so if they are weak, 
they shall always be weak, such was the case with Odin. Basically, think of how demons were once in the old SMT games, unable to level up so humans had to pick up the slack. One could link this back to their personality with how short-sighted they are, as none of the gods ever really seemed to grow. Even Lyneth herself never began to change from this mindset, and it took the memories of Platina to move her. And even then, she let people die so she could do her job as a Valkyrie. In order to get stronger, Odin's blood was mixed with an elves, divine mixed with mortal, and thus he could grow to be the top god in all the land. And Lyneth just happened to be fused with such a body after she lost hers. It was explained earlier, so I can kinda let this moment slide. At the very least, this isn't treated like an instant win in a Persona game, so I can beat the crap out of Loki myself. I just don't like having the text having to explain all this to me. Not too wordy, but it does kinda take away from the moment. And as some people pointed out, this ending with Lyneth reviving the world and getting to be with Lucian, the ending seems a bit too perfect. The game seems to think so too, taking note of other potential problems and foes. Brahms, for example, is doing well, somehow. Unaffected by the whole destruction wave thing. This is because he's Brahms, and there is no other reason. I'm dead serious, that was in an interview. Lazard, on the other hand, had used the Philosopher's Stone, losing it in the process, but his life isn't controlled by Lenneth. Of course, since the science worked in creating Lenneth, Lord knows what else this guy could do. And with Mistress Hell of Niflheim name drop, I wonder if they had a different idea for a sequel before coming up with what we have in Valkyrie Profile Samaria. If there's anything to take away from this game, I feel there's a common ground with death and growth. Now, not every character plot-wise follows this path due to how incomplete the story can feel, but it does feel like only as they approach death or it happens do they truly become different, if not outright better people. Lawfer became more bold and wanted to do the right thing for Angram's brother even if it meant death, and reconciled the idea in his head, all to follow the ideal just as he had. Shiho was once a song maiden whose singing turned ally soldiers into monsters who fought recklessly, and stopped singing since she was tired of the violence, tired of living this way and not knowing of anything else. Being blind likely didn't help either. In a way, death was kind of an escape from the harshness of the world, as she could experience something different when alongside Valkyrie. This is further help if So, the person who mourned her death, is able to join her after realizing how much blood stained his hands, how his path had veered far off course from what he wanted to do with his life, and both of them reuniting in Valhalla made them happy, able to live with each other once more. Sadly, you can't get this scene in ending A. Grey the Dark Knight was only allowed to live in armor after a friend sacrificed his life, and the guilt haunted him for who knows how long, and only by serving the Valkyrie is he able to try and achieve redemption, trying to make the most of the power instead of wasting his life in a constant state of depression. Of all the characters who I think changed the most, I think it was Mystina. I heard her describe this female Lazard, and given her lack of empathy, I could certainly see it that way. She was incredibly selfish and glad her teacher kicked the bucket. Plus, her desire for knowledge rivaled Lazard to the point where she used a machine to travel in spirit form and go anywhere she wished. She's unable to go to Valhalla for story reasons and her absurdly low heroic value, which is even worse than Argrim since even he becomes worthy on Harriar material, at least to me anyway. And yet despite that, Lenneth wants her, maybe due to wanting an ally against Lazard, but since Mystina is vital for breaking the seal, I assume Lenneth genuinely just wanted to aid her. After Lazard kills her, fearing her power may ruin things for him, she's essential in helping to revive Lenneth and does so without questioning it. Something clearly changed while traveling with Lenneth, and there's definitely a difference with how both Valkyries treated her. If nothing else, take it this way, death doesn't have to be the end of the physical body. It's similar to someone changing their personality to be someone better after being crappy, trying to find a new purpose when losing the previous one. And of course, never to lose sight of your humanity. The entire world of Midgard seemed designed to show how kindness was dying, and yet the warriors chosen proved they were worthy in Lenneth's eyes to be heroes, to be the ones to eventually save the world from Loki. Still, I recognize this is a lot to pull out of my ass, but I do enjoy the game despite the story flaws and despite how broken the game can be. There's a lot I have to be thankful for, from getting me interested in Norse mythology and for helping to lay the groundwork for one of my favorite combat systems, even if some of the games aren't really great. Look, judge me all you want, these are the perfect toy box RPGs beyond Super Robot Wars. Anyway, special thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping to make today's video. You too can help support me by supporting my Patreon or sharing this video among your friends. And all that other stuff I usually say. Next time. Actually, I wasn't planning on making this a Valkyrie Profile Marathon, but screw it. I want to feel more satisfied, and there's only one way to accomplish this. Next time, Valkyrie Profile 2, Silmaria. I'm the smartest moron, and thank you for watching.